Raid on Takao. This is a Taiwanese game by Mizo Games. So the topic, you you think, from the cover, is like, oh, it's a war game. Well, it's a war-themed game. Yes, it is about the war. It is about World War II, and in particular on this American bombing raid on Japanese-occupied Taiwan. It's inspired by real events. But unfortunately, it is that aspect of the war that is probably the ugliest, the most disturbing, the one that most deeply questions any narrative about the good guys and the bad guys when everybody is attacking military and industrial targets and also killing a lot of civilians in the process. Or, unfortunately, as we know, it happens in, war, in World War II, uh, bombing attacks civilian targets as their primary target to inflict moral losses on the opponent. That is just sad, tragic. And the game depicts that. It's about the raid from the perspective of the survivors. It is a, or oh, those that are trying to survive, mind you. It is a cooperative game. You can play it solo. Players are civilians that are caught in the tragedy as their town is falling apart, buildings are falling on them, food is hard to come by, clean water is hard to come by. Uh, people are getting wounded, are dying, and also, very important, they're losing their mind. This is a game that is remarkable to me because it's not just about the physical damage the war inflicts on the civilian populations, but also about the emotional, the mental toll. It's a game in which you're trying to survive, and it's a game in which you're also trying to retain your humanity, which is pretty powerful. Actually, I don't even know if you noticed this on the cover. It took me a while to see it. Uh, first glance is like this epic, epic war scene. But here, if you understand correctly, that figure that you see there, to me, it's look as a violinist. He's a guy who's just playing violin. And there is a violin player as one of the playing characters. I guess he can't escape, and so he may as well... Uh, remind himself of what makes him human, of what is worth to him, of the beauty, such as music, the humans can produce when they're not intent on causing this destruction. Yeah, it, it can get pretty deep. It's, it's a pretty. This game has a it's pretty uh, has a pretty strong emotional component. Everybody who played it with was reminded of, of Dead of Winter because of different objectives and relationships. But I'll tell you already. I think this one does it better. I think this one gets deeper and more visceral. This copy comes from Taiwan. Some of the components were translated and some not. There are some game components, at least in my copy, that are only in Chinese. They're not, uh, don't come with the English version. I probably just my copy, but you know, I have a Taiwanese friend, and so thanks to her, we're still able to play it. But if you buy the game, just check that they send you all of the English elements, components. Without further ado, Raid on Takao. Let's see how it works. This is a general look at the board of the game. It is divided in rectangles with different symbols that tell you what happens there. In some areas, you'll have bunkers that will protect you from air raids. Mountain symbols may make it harder to get there. However, railroads will help you move faster. Anchors representing ports, they can help with the movement and also they are the heart of some scenarios in which you are trying to rescue survivors from a shipwreck that happened far from the coast. You have uh, these uh, uh, magnifying glasses symbols here that tell you where to place these cards. The number changes on the number of players and also some scenarios will add some cards as objectives there. Generally speaking, uh, these are good things. It's food, are the tools that you will want to, to collect so that, uh, that you don't die and so that those items will help you complete the mission. Here you also have a symbol for a bomber and the rules says that at the beginning of the game you should place the bomber in the space or on the space with the symbol. And the bomber will then move. By the way, the bomber is represented by this really impressive metal coin. 
During the game, the bomber will move around the board and drop and, well, and create and drop ruin tokens or rabble tokens. The way the bomber moves, however, uh, it doesn't make any sense that the bomber will be in that space. The only way that the movement on the bomber makes sense, as described by the rules, if, is if the bomber moves on the outside of the board the next to the various spaces and so for example moving also from here to here like this edge and this edge are two separate spaces you for reasons that I hope to show you later trust me play it that way otherwise the bomber absolutely makes no sense all the characters start there in the central station and they will go around doing different things depending on the victory conditions of the scenario you win if you're able to meet the victory conditions of the scenario that you're playing. You lose if even just one of your players, one of your characters dies, or in any case becomes uh, incapacitated. How does that happen when your despair matches your poor health? Each player will control a character that will be represented on the board by a standee, such as this one, and then you have a character card. Unfortunately, I'm sure that they have English version of these character cards, but they didn't send me any. They were not included in the copy of the game. Lucky enough, I have a Taiwanese friend who was able to translate all different things. And frankly, the only thing that you need to know is that this symbol here means religious affiliation. There are different religious symbols on the board, uh, say, uh, like that one, the one right there. And basically each character has a religious place that brings them solace, that makes them feel better when they get there. She go, she feels better when she goes to that, represented by that yellow symbol. Then there's a special ability which you can use once per turn and you flip this marker up to use it to record that. If I remember correctly, her ability is that you can add one despair point and reroll the bomber die, which is what determines how the bomber moves. Here you have your health and your despair. Yes, if this goes up enough and this goes down enough to the point that they meet, then that is when the character is dead, or in any case so desperate that the character is unable to play, to continue helping, and this is when the players lose the game. Here, in this section here, you record the actions that you take and that you can take. You have two stamina tokens, and they're placed there in this section at the beginning of the game. During the game, the game starts, well, each turn starts with a survival phase. I hope they, I wish they called it the action phase, because that is really what it is. It's when the players perform actions with their characters. They can do that, uh, they will do that one after the other, and you can perform any of these three actions. You simply move a stamina point to the action that you are performing, you perform it, and then you move it down there. And for the time being, it sits there. This one, this action here, allows you to move three spaces on the board, and that's pretty self-explanatory. It's just, you move or tug only from space to space. It costs more to go from a non-mountain space to a mountain space, but generally speaking, one, two, three, you just go. This one, this action here, allows you to move by uh, up to two spaces, and you can pick up one of these cards in a space in which you are. So that is how you pick up these cards and say maybe you get the wild boar which is a very cute little animal and you can also turn it into food. <laughs> Vegetables, free food. When you get these cards you will place a number of food tokens on them and when you consume food simply you remove them you remove them from there. And there are some interesting things here. We have a medical liquor, yams. We have an animal carcass. Uh, very sad when you see an animal like that. That is as food, but will make you sick. But maybe, oh, the helmet protects you. Uh, but there is a fireplace somewhere that will allow you, see if I can find it, probably not, will allow you to feel a bit better. Hey, a little bit of drinks uh, lowers your despair. That's what I always say. And so, just different things. But I really like how 
you can put pet you can use pets in different ways one of them as food which i totally totally respect especially in times of war nope i can't find the fireplace but trust me this e card would allow you to use the animal as it says the animal carcass without taking damage so players will perform these actions oh another thing rubble or ruins these tokens will be placed on the board as the game progresses and a player cannot enter a space that contains a ruin if a ruin is placed there while you're there then you will take uh, two points of damage you will lose two points of health and you can move out of it normally but again you cannot enter unless you remove the rubble also if you're in a bunker when when rubble is added then you don't take damage but if a second rubble should be added to an area with the bunker the bunker is destroyed but back to us since you cannot enter an area that contains rubble the option is well to clean it up a little bit if you take this action here then you can move up to two spaces and remove a rubble token from a space adjacent to where you are so this is general idea but again that means that taking actions will put your markers down here maybe you take a single action and you save a marker stamina marker for later maybe all of your markers will be here at the end of the action phase slash survival phase we we'll see what that implies then you also also important during the game during the action survival phase players also have some free actions such as exchanging items when they're in the same space super important because that is when you may have a player that performs some of the things that are needing the scenario somebody else is going around collecting food and bringing them food it really creates this very realistic interesting synergy then after players take their scenario slash action phase, there is a scenario phase in which things may happen related to a specific scenario you're playing. Then the air raid phase. You roll this die, which will produce numbers between 1 and 3, and you move the bomber by a number, by that number of spaces clockwise around the board. Say I roll the 2, 1, 2, and then here we go. After you move the, the bomber, you will add rubble in each space that the bomber is facing. And that's why the bomber really needs to be not on the board, because here, which one is the, the one that is facing straight forward. Also, as the bomber moves around the edge, if it's on the edge, it will only hit the edges and never the central spaces. But again, we move it here, so from there, then we add destruction to all of the spaces facing and there can only be one destruction but again a potential second destruction in a spot would destroy a bunker after the air raid phase you have the consumption phase when people need to uh, can spend food can spend food to recover their stamina their stamina remember your stamina tokens that may both be there maybe one is there one is not a single food that you consume will allow you to recover the stamina so then you can perform actions again you can also choose uh, to uh, exert yourself to drain yourself in which case you recover a point of stamina at the cost of a point of health so you're getting closer and closer to dying after that, you reset your special ability if you used it, and pretty much the turn is over. One important thing, though, that really adds to the psychology of the game is that each character has a set of three cards. They are placed in the order that you see here, one, two, and three. They tell you about what the character struggled with psychologically. We know bombs are falling, we know people are hungry, we know there's what is hard to find drinking water, etc. Et On top of that, we're human beings, so we're also worried about other things like the brother that can be found. Basically, each character again has a stack of cards. You can only interact with the one on top that is visible at any given time and you can choose to fulfill it that is there's a fulfillment condition if you meet it then you will take the card 
and flip it this way and you will place it under your character sheet with the fulfillment size showing. That means that now every time she performs the, the search action she will collect two cards instead of one. Pretty neat, huh? It may also be that you decide uh, you don't have the resources, the opportunity to, re to fulfill that requirement and you simply leave it there, nothing happens. Or it may be that uh, you decide that you don't want this card on top of your deck because you want to get to the next one, so you simply turn it to the regret side without fulfilling it, in which case you place it here. And it has a different effect. For example, yeah, you still have that effect, but with a limitation, uh, which is not here. Oh, here it is. This is the limitation, as opposed to this one is always available. So as you can see, the fulfill side is better than the regretful side. But again, either you fulfill it, either by fulfilling it or turning it into a regret, then you have access to the second card, and again. So as the game progresses, there will be a mix of things you fulfill and things that you regret, but the psychology of your character will become more complex as also different uh, uh, game options will become available. And this is how you play Raid on Takao. This is a powerful game. It was a powerful experience playing this game. I play war games and so of course we see a little more of a sanitized element. It's not that the war game depicting the battlefield, especially if it's back in the day before we started bombing cities, it's not that the battlefield tells us that there's no suffering going on in the civilian population. It simply narrows the scope to the battle as we examine that event and somehow indirectly, yes, it sanitizes history a little bit without falsifying it. But then you look at the at the ugly other side of the story, especially in modern warfare in which the civilian population becomes the hostage, becomes the target. So, and the story and the game does a really good job of portraying the humanity of the characters involved, thanks to the system of personal objectives. Yes, some of the descriptions of what they're thinking, uh, they may sound a little cheesy, they may sound a little bit like a soap opera based on historical events, a soap opera in times of war. But it's okay, because then you have that deep emotional connection with the fact that you are controlling these people, you are connected, your de their destiny matters to you as you're trying to help them survive and retain the humanity and see that, uh, again, that they do what makes them human. As a parent, for example, there's the character of the mother who is worried about her children, and to me that was, that's too close home. I don't. I don't know that I want to play that character. And then all sort of uh, terrible stuff can happen. People become violent, uh, irritable, uh, bulimic, depressed, desperate, etc., etc. People, the characters, which is powerful. Which is powerful. At the same time, in terms of gameplay, also works very well because you have cooperative games in which players have incentives to guess what? Wait for it. Cooperate. And in fact, in pandemic, there is nothing wrong with cooperating. Here, the game portrays the complexity of human interactions in that there are many cases in which people would benefit from cooperating, but because of what's going on, they don't. And so you may have a situation in which a character has a certain has a certain uh, trait, uh, has acquired, say, the violent trait, and so people should not go next to that person, but at the same time, for the game to work, you have to work with them. And so it also teaches important lessons, about, again, about the fragility of the human mind, uh, of the fragility of being human, at the same time, how hard and yet necessary it is to cooperate with people that you don't necessarily like, that don't necessarily want to work with you. Cooperation may be much harder than, say, we're seeing pandemic, the dispatcher moving the scientists, so the scientists can meet the researcher, etc., etc., etc. Cooperation is a mess, and the game really captures that. And somehow, again, uh, probably because of the connection with the realistic historical event, I find this game so much more powerful than Dead of Winter. Dead of Winter, I always liked the idea, but somehow the execution left me a little bit cold. Like, okay, I, I see there's, there's the psychology, there are the objectives. I don't know why somehow it wasn't as intense as I expected it could be and as Radon Takao turned out to be. Again, probably because this is about historical events and although the zombie apocalypse may happen at any time, it hasn't yet. 
and yet knowing that this is the kind of struggle that people experience, have experienced in war, experienced in war, to me that was very powerful. Definitely an intense experience, so much so that I don't know, that's, that's definitely not a crowd pleaser. This is not a game that I would just take out anytime we feel like playing a simple cooperative game. Because in terms of rules, it's simpler than Pandemic. Um, it could be a great gateway game, but then uh, some of your players would get depressed and just not the kind of topic that you play every day or it's always the right situation to play it. Which again, in a certain sense, is a compliment that they play to the game that portrays its topic and the dynamics of the topic so vividly that in fact it's something that you well may not be able, may not be willing to experience every day. Uh, to us it was powerful, again, maybe also because of Taiwanese friend, being from there, knowing this from her family history, an intense game, definitely unusual. Mechanically, the game is, is good. It's good. There is nothing wrong with it. Without that human element, it would be maybe an even simpler version of Pandemic, and that would be a little, um, a little too flavorless, mainly. But as is, this is a mechanically simple, yet thematically intense game. Uh, there are some things in the translation of the rules so that, uh, well, they probably were lost in translation, got me a little bit confused, but I think we figured out more or less how to play it, or well, at least the way we play it. Is it wrong? I don't know, but we had a great time playing it, so we maybe we came out with, we came up with a good variant. But when I say about great time, I'm not telling it was a blast, we were laughing, cheering, etc, etc. Great time because we had an emotional immersion in a very complex situation and the game did, I think, a great job in depicting precisely that. Raid on Takao, it's a good game, not to play with everybody, not for every game night, but definitely a unique and very successful, I believe, take on, on warfare, on modern warfare.